Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. Since Guardians of the Galaxy is out in theaters this week, I wanted to do a review. Since most of you probably have not seen the movie yet, I'm going to do my non-spoilery review first, and then I'll get into spoilers. And since they've already confirmed the sequel, I will mention a few possible storylines, but I'm going to do a separate video that's going to explore that a lot more deeply. When we do get into spoilers, I'll talk about a lot of the Easter eggs because there are a lot of good ones. Hello to any new people. If you're just finding me for the first time, I do Marvel videos every week. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. There's a bunch of new Marvel TV shows coming that I'm going to be doing videos for. Most of you probably at least know who the Guardians are, even if you've never read the comics. The biggest generalization you could make is Space Avengers. Like a bunch of super assholes who come together to form a team and keep the villains from destroying the galaxy. Which galaxy, you ask? Generally, it's assumed in this movie that it's the Milky Way galaxy, but they never say officially. Most of what you've probably been hearing about the movie is how much everyone loves it, which is kind of surprising because the movie has just come out. A lot of the credit for that goes to director James Gunn. He directed and wrote the script. He's mostly known for really small cult films like Slither, which stars Nathan Fillion, who also had a really funny cameo in this movie. Gunn just has a really amazing and unique literary and visual sense that really comes across. The executives at Marvel Studios still have a lot of say over what stuff looks like and sounds like in the end. But the really classic Star Wars steampunky feel that the movie has flows from James Gunn, as well as the expression of a lot of the amazing 80s pop culture jokes. The other thing you can thank James Gunn for is the banging awesome mixtape soundtrack. They've been marketing it as the awesome mix number one. Hooked on a Feeling is the song you probably heard the most, but there's a laundry list of other classic 70s and 80s songs. The mixtape is just something that flows from Chris Pratt's Star-Lord character. The director has a lot of influence over how character affectations are expressed in a movie, and obviously James Gunn chose to push that forward, and I think it was a great choice. So of all the things to admire in this movie, the thing you should be most grateful for is James Gunn and the way he treated the material. Let's talk about the actors' performances a little bit, because they were all amazing, but of all of them, I think my favorites were obviously Chris Pratt, Bradley Cooper, and Vin Diesel. The reason I gave extra high fives to Chris Pratt is just because of all the other actors in the film, he's the least experienced in terms of big blockbuster movies, especially action movies, and he's the lead. He's on screen the most, so if he didn't bring it, the movie would totally suck, no matter how cool James Gunn made it look or sound. Trust me, you will totally get the tone of his performance in the first five minutes he's on screen. Not even that, maybe like the first 30 seconds he's on screen. It's amazing. He has a really great introduction. Bradley Cooper and Vin Diesel have been action stars for a long time, so I judge them a lot more harshly, but because they're mocap, they had to do everything with just their voice and their facial expressions. The visual effects artists are able to control a lot of what the character expressions are, but they're mocapped actors, so essentially when Groot and Rocket Raccoon smile or yell, it's the actors doing that. They basically, the digital artists just paste the characters on top of their faces. Bradley Cooper speaks with this really funny brogue that makes you completely forget that he's Bradley Cooper and allows you to just enjoy this really funny, foul-mouthed, cynical raccoon. And Vin Diesel only gets three words he's allowed to speak. Technically, it's four lines, but really it's just the three, the I am Groot. I think he recorded his dialogue in like four or five different languages, so if you go see the movie in French or Spanish, you'll hear Vin Diesel's voice speaking those lines in French and Spanish. He totally sells Groot, but a lot of the added fun of that character is in the physical expressions and the way he reacts with his face. Karen Gillan was so much fun to watch as the villain Nebula. Full disclosure, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan in case you just subscribed to me and you haven't seen the billion Doctor Who videos that I've done, so I've been a fan of hers for a long time, but seeing her play a villain was just so much fun. Like a lot of supporting characters, she doesn't get a ton of screen time, but she definitely makes it count. Lee Pace, for all you Pushing Daisies and Thranduil fans, was amazing as the most crazy villain I have ever seen in a Marvel movie. Seriously, no joke, he is over the top batshit crazy in this movie, and I totally bought it. He's covered in makeup head to toe, so you do forget who's underneath, and you just focus on his voice and his performance. Benicio Del Toro is also one of those really amazing secondary characters that's not on screen a lot, but feels like a very big character in the Marvel Universe. The Collector is a really interesting character, and as ridiculous as he sounds and looks, Benicio Del Toro described himself in the movie as like a space Liberace, so you should definitely think of his acting choices as being completely intentional. The affectations that he brings to the character is something that's written into that role, so he's supposed to be that way. I'll just go ahead and say that this is my new favorite Marvel movie. It hits all the right action movie beats, all the characters land, and compared to the other big Marvel movies like Avengers, it's visually much more interesting. You'll totally be blown away. For example, Think about the color red. It's very, very important in this movie. Almost everything in the movie has this red overcast to it, and James Gunn said that it was his reaction to the dark, brooding science fiction movies that have come out since Blade Runner. Not to say that Blade Runner was something that he did not like, it's just that he wanted to return science fiction to the pulpiness of the 50s and 60s, give it like a much more fun feel, much more optimistic. 
He just didn't want to give Guardians that downer feel that, say, like 70s sci-fi movies like Alien had, which is also visually an amazing movie, but a total downer ending. Guardians is all about childlike wonder and discovery, which you see mirrored in Chris Pratt's character. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, just think about the color red when you're sitting there in the theater. I guess you could say that the color red is also a metaphor for the influence that Iron Man has had on the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that first Iron Man film. Like the popularity of that character and the irreverent tone of the first Iron Man film has trickled down into all other Marvel films. To be fair though, red is Marvel's trademark logo color, so red has always been very important to Marvel as a brand. But overall, I give this movie a solid A+. I think it's the only A+, I've given to any movie this year, and there were a lot of movies that I love this year. But now, let's get into spoilers. So I'm going to talk about specific moments, and I'll talk about some of the big Easter eggs. So careful in case you haven't seen the movie yet. I'll wait just a second. Okay, everybody ready? Here we go. My biggest surprise in the movie was how quickly they went to Thanos and the Infinity Stones. I still think of them as Infinity Gems, even though I just saw the movie and I'm trying to remember if Benicio Del Toro called them gems or stones, I have no idea why they feel like they need to change little details like that in the movies, but whatever. The explainer scene that Benicio Del Toro gave on the gems is my favorite scene in the movie. It very clearly states that super powerful beings were not able to contain the power of all six gems when they were brought together. Did you notice how there was no gauntlet in that scene? So clearly the big WTF surprise of Avengers 3 is Thanos wielding all six gems in the gauntlet. I feel like the real fun will be the way they express the power of each gem on screen. And here's something weird. In the movies and in the comics, the colors of each gem are different. Like the space gem, the one that teleports things, is the cube that we see in the first Avengers movie. It's kind of bluish. But in the classic comics, like the Thanos Infinity Gauntlet story, the space gem is purple, like the one we see in the Guardians movie. Funny side note, in the comics, Drax the Destroyer, the person that Batista plays in this movie, is the keeper of the power gem. It's just funny and meta. It gets really confusing, I know. Especially when you consider that Loki's staff contains the mind gem, which also kind of looks bluish, like the Tesseract space gem. I wish there were a screen cap of the movie during that Del Toro explainer scene, just because they had this really clear graphic with six different objects just showing each of the gems and the objects that they were represented by. So just to move on real quickly to sequel teasers before I talk about Easter eggs. Some of the biggest were obviously Peter Quill's father. Clearly the sequel is going to explore that. Then there's Thanos and the Collector's Hunt for the gems. That's just going to continue through the other Marvel films. And then there's always the possibility of the Guardians visiting Earth. But of all those things, I don't expect that to happen. The Guardians visiting Earth in the sequel. I feel like Marvel and James Gunn will keep the Guardian stories in space. It's just going to be like their go-to space franchise. Obviously at some point space has to cross over with all the Earth-based Avengers stories, but I think they're just going to let characters from each team moonlight. I did a video a while back about a certain Avenger maybe being in the Guardian sequel, so I'll post a link to that in the description. There was also a spoiler this week for the post credit scene with Howard the Duck. Just to explain that a little bit, Howard the Duck is a Marvel character, even though we haven't seen him in the comics in a long time. I feel like the only people that will understand this when they see the movie are people who have seen the Howard the Duck movie or have read the comics. The reason it's in Guardians is because of Gene Colan. He was the artist that originated Guardians of the Galaxy, and he had a hand in working on the original Howard the Duck comic. So really it's like a comic book easter egg, but you could also consider it an easter egg for the movie just because of all the 80s pop culture references. That was actually a Lucasfilm movie by the way, as in Star Wars George Lucas. Think of Howard the Duck as like the progenitor of Rocket Raccoon, like wisecracking animals. Howard the Duck debuted in 1973, which did come after the original Guardians of the Galaxy team, which started in 1969, but that initial team did not feature Rocket Raccoon. That character didn't debut until 1976. The Guardians in this team, like the team makeup and the characters, more closely resemble the characters from the 2008 comic, the Annihilation Conquest team. They rebooted the comic again last year in 2013, so if you are looking for Guardians comics to read, I'd just start with the reboot. It features Iron Man joining the Guardians, it's really cool. It has this really funny sex scene between him and Gamora, as you would expect Iron Man to try and have sex with everyone in space. So here are some of the biggest easter eggs in the movie, there's some good ones. First off, Peter Quill's spaceship, the Milano, is actually named after the character's childhood crush. Alyssa Milano, which is kind of funny. Remember, he's a 70s and 80s pop culture junkie, so a lot of his references are frozen at the point of where he left the Earth, like in the 1980s. He probably hasn't seen any movies, TV shows, or music from after that point, so he has no idea who Justin Bieber is. Imagine the disappointment when he learns about that. I thought one of the funniest things was whenever he called Kevin Bacon one of the greatest heroes ever, the legend of Footloose. Inside the Collector's Museum, there's a ton of awesome stuff, like Cosmo the Dog, a Dark Elf, a Shatari, and a slug from James Gunn's earlier movie, Slither, starring Nathan Fillion. Nathan Fillion's cameo in the movie is almost unrecognizable. 
He's that giant alien who gets Groot's branches stuck up his nose. You can kind of tell it's him by his voice. Stanley's cameo is pretty obvious. It's pretty funny whenever a rocket raccoon just calls him a total creeper. Rob Zombie had a voice only cameo as the navigator of Yondu's ship and James Gunn's mentor Lloyd Kaufman was a prisoner inside the kiln scenes. You could consider Nowhere an easter egg, but they did call it out verbally. In the comics, people can use the brainstem of that ancient celestial, the inside, to travel anywhere in space and time. We haven't really dealt with time travel in the Marvel Cinematic Universe yet though, but maybe in Phase 4, sometime in the future. I'm not expecting it anytime soon. The opening scene is a pretty clear riff on Raiders of the Lost Ark. If only Indy had a magnet to draw that idol off the trap. So they're not really easter eggs, but there are five really big planets that they visit in the movie that are really big in the comics too. First off is Hala, the Kree homeworld. It debuted in the comics about the same time Captain Marvel debuted. That's Captain Marvel, not Captain Marvel. Different characters. Xandar is the home base of the Nova Corps and Richard Ryder, the superhero Nova. James Gunn said that he kind of hates the character so he might not make it into the sequel. He says it's just the helmet. He hates the helmet. The planet did get destroyed during the Annihilation Conquest storyline, which was kind of something they alluded to in the movie a little bit. The kiln, that prison, was also a pretty famous prison planet in the comics. It even held Thanos for a little while. And Nowhere, I already talked about, but in the comics, Cosmo the Space Dog was actually the administrator there. Clearly something that James Gunn decided to change. And Morag 4, the planet where they found that orb, was featured during Annihilation Conquest. It featured a pretty epic battle between Quasar and Moondragon. So just to talk about stories for the sequel, a couple possibilities that they could draw from include the Thanos Imperative, War of Kings, and Annihilation Conquest. Thanos Imperative was a culmination of Conquest and War of Kings though, so they'd have to establish Inhumans and a few other things before dealing with the Cancerverse and the stuff that happened during the Imperative storyline. It also featured the Infinity Gauntlet, and they're not quite there in the movies yet either. Quick side note though, Inhumans could be one of those six mystery Marvel movies that they just announced. I actually still need to do an Inhumans video at some point pretty soon. But let me know what your favorite part of the movie was and what story do you want to see them do in the sequel. My next Marvel video is going to be a Guardians 2 video. It's just going to go in depth to what some of those potential storylines are going to be. Be sure to subscribe to get it. I'll try and post it by early next week. But right now, click here to learn all about the Avengers 2 footage at Comic-Con and click here to learn all about the Batman vs Superman footage. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tonight. High fives.